you are all warmly, warmly welcome to this occasion. Today we have guests from all, basically from all continents. Okay, we calculated that there are participants from 30 different countries. So we are very pleased that you could join us today. I'm your host today with my colleague Matthias Taile. Matthias has been uh, within the forum since beginning 2018, and he is also an insider when it comes to the okay, mechanical forest industry. Besides that all, he is also running the World Bioeconomy Forum membership programs called World Bioeconomy Circle. Hello, Matthias. We get this. Thank you, Hugo. I'm fine. Thank you very much. Can you yeah, elaborate uh, your role in the forum? What do you do? Yeah. Let me first introduce, uh, introduce myself. My name is Matthias Scheile, and I'm responsible here in this forum for the membership uh, program. I'm working with the forum since 2018, as you can said already. And since April 2021, we implemented the membership program. And the membership program is foreseen to bring together more intensively the members of our mm -hmm. forum and to go deeper in detail for discussions, to bring up our visions, to discuss strategies, and to bring together the people like in a club. So only to be more intensive linked inside our community. And as I said, every three year, months, we bring up a new uh, membership event and so-called insider insight. Mm -hmm. And we can come up with new and very, very strategic items, which we will bring together with all the other people as well. So we are very intensive on the way. Mm, so great, so great. So today we are having a very exciting session today, we we'll hope, uh, with a uh, very impressive lineup of the speakers. And what's more, as always, this session by Prakradas is moderated by Ludo Dils. I know that Ludo, you are here, and okay, we will introduce a bit, bit later. So uh, and maybe a few words about this, that, okay, um, and this season 2022. So uh, this, um, this round table indeed is then, okay, the point where we are officially launching the okay, activities of the year 2022. Preparation for the forum 2022 are well underway. We will uh, announce then, okay, team and location and the dates of the forum still this month. Uh, Last year, okay, was culminated uh, in Belém in Brazil, and um, I think it okay among the most remarkable results of it. Uh, we can now say that okay, the very first bioeconomy strategy in Brazil was launched within our forum, and it is uh, also among the very first one in entire Latin America. Having the forum in Brazil was very much in line with our. Uh, internal strategy uh, that uh, uh, we are having these forums every second year in the southern hemisphere and every second year in the northern hemisphere so you might guess that we are going to have then okay the next next forum but we will get back to that okay later on this this month always when organizing these kind of uh, uh, okay uh, occasion okay one cannot avoid talking about the COVID-19 and um, we are seeing some signs that, okay, hopefully we are getting over it. Uh, at least there are already some nations you are already regarding as an ordinary flu. So hopefully by September, when we are organizing uh, our next, next forum, that they, you can then come there and visit us in, in person. Also during this season, uh, we uh, introduce uh, several new features like these roundtable events. We will keep on repeating these roundtable events also this year. We also uh, introduce the YouTube channel. And by the way, also this roundtable will be recorded. And uh, uh, during the next week, uh, it will be then okay, uh, published within our YouTube channel. Also, uh, I'm very proud that we have okay, uh, uh, launched okay, uh, news app um, for the bioeconomy so you could then follow the bioeconomy news that, okay uh, to your mobile phones wherever you are but uh, this membership program uh, Matthias maybe you can then tell a bit more that what do we mean by this yes I will this membership program is done every th uh, third month a year and we've come up with very special items in these uh, events 
Uh, last year, we have had the first one with an EU representative speaking about the Green Deal, about the EU. That's a 20 minutes impulse, and then afterwards, one hour, one and a half hour discussion around this point. The second one was about the Lancer Tech technologies and their approach regarding the bioeconomy things. That was number two. Number three was uh, organized with company Andritz. They spoke about the circle to zero strategy of the Andritz tech technologies so very interesting things as well and we had a lot of discussions around these things and that is going on and we will have the next event on 15th on march uh, 2 p.m i believe and we speak about the availability of uh, timber and wood wood and timber worldwide and regarding the eu policies bringing up the idea to to keep the material in the forest we say from the other hand we need this material for our usage in the uh, uh, wood industry for wood construction things and so so we have a nice or we will have a very interesting presentation by a real representative of this area to come up in a really really i believe in a very hard discussion around this issue so that will be in march 15th on march but i would like to make some something clear as well we would like to make it clear that to our audience that the world bioeconomy is a very open and welcoming platform. We have all sorts of ways you can get engaged through our membership packages, but you can do it as well simply to interact with us. We have a great bunch of people associated with us now from all ranks and files of all over the world, and we are all anyhow linked with the global circular bioeconomy. So don't hesitate to approach us for any purposes. Mm -hmm. And we would like to invite you to the next Bioeconomy Forum, as you got told about already, that will be uh, published in the, this month uh, pretty month. soon. Yeah. So, yeah. Yuka, tell us, the audience, what we have in store for them today, please. Yeah, today, indeed, that we are focusing on the thematic area of the bioproduct around us. Uh, and we are repeating these thematic areas. We have these four pillar structure. Uh, which is embedded in all our activities that we are, we are providing to you. We hope by this okay, four pillar structure, the bioeconomy can be better explained. We don't think that there is okay, one fit all um, bioeconomy. Instead, there are okay, bioeconomy based on the old strengths. And these four pillars are the bioeconomy, people, planet policies. We, we are typically communicating together with politicians, but the, the, the regulators, how do they receive and okay, the uh, possibilities of the bioeconomy. Uh, then the secondly, that okay, we think that it, it is very important to have them okay these uh, um, corporates to be then engaged. So and also the financial world. That's the reason the second that, okay pillar is named as the corporate leaders and the financial world. Thirdly, that, okay, we are talking about the bioproduct around us, like today, because we think that okay, it is very important. Uh, to make these uh, okay, bio-based value chains more tangible, even to ordinary consumers. So that's the reason we are keep on repeating this bioproduct around us. And typically there are companies or there are institutes to telling their story or their narrative. And then finally, is then okay, the fourth pillar is then okay, look into the future, where we are then selectively taking the topics which are sort of relevant on that specific season. I can say already now, that for this season, we are very much focusing on the, okay, what's then the interconnection between the bioeconomy and the climate change. We are partially already hovering that topic in this uh, roundtable. We keep on repeating that topic also in our upcoming coffee events, because we think that okay, the bioeconomy deserves to be recognized as an additional tool to mitigate the climate change. That's the reason we are keeping keeping up of these kind of topics. And it is really one of the major topics also for our annual, annual forum. So uh, that's in, the, in a general picture. So uh, Matthias, maybe now it's time to tell us that the, how do we run this round table today? Please. Matthias. Yeah, uh, that maybe this is online shows are not the very best things. It's clear we would like to sit together, do it in, in personal present, presentation, but we have to do it in online now. That is how it is. So. I would like to give some, some features to introduce us. We can build really, really, really high, big buildings with 28 floors, 29 floors, 80, 85 meters tall, 
in wood construction. That's nice. That is really, uh, from the engineering point of view, that is challenging. These are really, really very sophisticated things. But how much wood is used today and what can we really do with this material? Just a couple of numbers. Uh, worldwide, we are just harvesting more than 4 billion cubic meters per year on wood. As it means all kinds of uh, wood materials. And only, only less than 45, 46% are used as sawn wood or as for wooden constructions. Most of the material is getting burned for any energy uh, purposes worldwide. And I think there's a real potential that we bring up or we bring this material in other usages to really can get stores the carbon dioxide in and woody constru wooden constructions, wooden products and so on. So that must be our goal to bring up really the usage of our material, of our nice, really high sophisticated engineering material in new usages, new products, wooden constructions and so on. So that's a real long time strategy. And that is a goal for all of us to go in that direction. We speak about bioproducts today, and we have so, uh, and decided for wooden construction. And we have a rich and varied panel made up for experts from some of the top companies operating in hand alongside the bioeconomy in wood constructions. We would like to make this event today as interactive as possible. So please make sure you share your comments and ask your questions using the chat box, please. So uh, I am taking care about the chat box that we come up with all these questions later on to bring that up to the audio, to our uh, panelists. And uh, moderating, the, the moderator of today is Ludo Deals. So Ludo, I would like, as a very important person inside the bioeconomy and the European as a, well as a worldwide uh, levels. So welcome Ludo. Ludo, you have a wonderful long bio, so I would like to shorten this and make, not to read everything here, maybe you can introduce yourself a little bit, what you are doing worldwide, and um, I think it's too long if I read all the things here, please. <laughs> Thanks a lot, uh, Matthias. So I'm uh, Rudolf Dils, I'm doctor in chemistry and biotechnology and professor emeritus at the Antwerp University. I'm involved in a lot of biotechnological projects. I'm uh, the chairman of the advisory board of the BioRizon Shared Research Center, on bio-based aromatics. And at the moment, I'm also the, um, the chair of the advisory and programming group of the um, uh, ASPIRE uh, Processes for Planet Public-Private uh, Partnership. I will keep it uh, there. Thanks a lot, um, and uh, Matthias, for this uh, introduction. And uh, sure, we really- sure, please. We really- no, You can start, the floor is yours, please. Thank you. So um, thanks a lot. And uh, dear wood and forestry friends, um, I would like to refer first to the uh, last uh, World Bioeconomy Forum conference in Belém, and where we had also a session on bioproducts around us. And there we remember very well the presentation made by Konstantin Zoner of the Tom Crowther Lab at the ETH in Zurich. They calculated that we have space for about 0.9 billion hectares extra afforestation without harming any use by humans. So this extra forest could take 205 billion tons of carbon, which is in fact two thirds of the already released carbon since the industrial revolution. But it only makes sense if we start this afforestation now. So we foresee in the future a session on these afforestation initiatives. And it was also mentioned that uh, on the 15th of March, we will be, have a, a meeting on availability of wood, etc. But today, the session will deal with the challenges of using this wood uh, in a bio-based economy and especially for long lasting products, especially today in construction. Therefore, I'm really delighted to present you today our speakers and panelists, and they will give a short introduction of each about max 10 minutes, and afterwards we start the panel discussion. They will give an overview of the exciting potential of wood-based constructions, the added value of wood-based chemicals for engineered wood, and the healthy life conditions of wood-based housings. 
I must say that um, I'm quite used to moderate panels among scientists, industry, policy makers, social scientists, etc. But today we have three architects in our panel. So I will have to step out a little bit of my comfort zone, but I really look forward to a great discussion. And I promise you, we will have, uh, you will see really amazing buildings during the coming sessions. So let us first start with Oliver Stirl. He was born in 1969. He comes from Villach in Carinthia in Austria. He studied architecture at the Technical Universities of Graz and Vienna up to 1999. And since 2005, he's a partner and the managing director of RLP, Rudiger Leiner und Partner. In addition to his work in the office, he's very active in lecturing and participating in numerous juries in Austria and abroad. Oliver will really set the scene today and he will speak about hybrid constructions competence in various scales. Oliver, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Ludo. First of all, good afternoon to everybody. So now you could see my, my screen. Um, as you can see, this is a hybrid construction sheet and uh, we start with wood as building material, uh, not in the stone age, even before when men started huts, uh, building huts, they started to use the building material wood and mostly in the context of hybrid construction. So combined with clay, with stones, with brick, with whatever. And um, outgoing from these ideas, we developed uh, the, the construction, the system of our wooden tower, which is 84 meters high, which is situated in Vienna. And uh, since this time, since the year 2016, we tried to transform the ideas and the knowledge we got from this project into smaller buildings, into not so high building, but into the urban area. So we tried to bring wood as a usual material into the urban area. But today I will tell you about the Ho Ho project, the uh, wooden tower, which consists of two parts. The lower one, as you can see here on the left-hand side, called Ho Ho Next, with 13 and 23 meters high, and the tower, which is 40, 57, and 84 meters high. They're connected underneath with technic and uh, garage areas. So the whole thing is situated in the Seestadt Aspen, which is an urban development area with about 240 hectares wide, which is situated in uh, the southeast of the city of Vienna. And as the name uh, says, Seestadt Aspen means sea town Aspen. Uh, we have a lake town Aspen. We have a lake in the center with a loop around it. And we have certain multi-construction sites which are developed since the year 2007. And for one of the multi-construction sites in the south of the lake, as you can see here on bottom right, the uh, orange one, this is called Seepark Quartier, has 11 hectares. Our office won the urban competition in 2011. And uh, the idea was somehow to develop a piece of land along a main axis. We, we call this transversale. And this is somehow a addition of different spaces and places with different urban qualities and different uh, proportions. So somehow like a chain, chain necklace. And those transversale is connected to the surrounding areas with uh, beneath axis, which we call capillars. And in between, we have multi-construction sites, which are developed from different colleagues since the year 2011. And for this area and the surrounding area, we have a high tower study and with all the different proportions, volumes, shifts, and uh, uh, tower heights, we create a very unique skyline to the lake. And this is somehow a surplus for everybody. This gives orientation, this gives identification. And one of the towers, as you can see here, this is our Ho Ho project. And this is a European skyscraper, which means it's acting and interacting with the surrounding. It's part of the urban context of the Seepark Quartier. And it's situated in the final stop of the subway station U2, as you can see here. And this gives you two totally different urban situations. So first, when you come out of the subway station, you enter a plaza. And this is not only the plaza of our house. This is uh, the 
main entrance of the whole area of the Sepak Quartier. And therefore, it was very important to have a multi-usage building, not a living building, a multi-usage building with hotels, with flats, uh, with, um, uh, hot with office spaces, with wellness, fitness, health, beauty, restaurants, and some shops. So to bring 24 hours of life on this plaza. And when you get out of the plaza, you have huge building in front of you. So everything is about the human scale. So therefore, we stepped down the volumes of the building to the plaza, and we invented a horizontal sheltering roof, which comes out of the ceiling of the first floor of the tower. And this gives you as person an optical line where you somehow can relate to the whole huge building. The second um, situation is to the lake. Here, everything is about orientation. It's about identification. Here, the building has to, be, has to have a, a high appearance. It has to have a strong charisma. Of course, flexibility and variability is a very important part of our project. So we have a very, very simple system. We have load-bearing exterior walls, and we have a load-bearing core. And in between, as you can see here in orange, we have a layer, it's about eight meet, seven meter deep, uh, where you can bring in every usage very easily and you can change it very easily. And we have two cores, as you can see here in red. And by connecting those two cores, we can divide each floor from one to three units. And the whole thing is a shell and core system. So from the beginning on, the shell was fixed, the core was fixed, but we didn't know the uses and we didn't know the definite usages. So to show the capability of this building, like you can see here, we draw floor plans of every usage and every floor. It's a hybrid construction. So we have a core made of reinforced concrete, and in the core, we have the staircases, the elevator tucts, the tucts. This is made on site. Attached to that, we have a wooden structure, which is a prefab structure. So we have parallel production processes, and therefore we can minimize the building period and we can optimize the assembling. And the assembling can be optimized because the system is so, so simple. It's just four elements. We have on the facade of every floor, we have on the outside, we, there's a horizontal reinforced concrete beam running. This is for the very, very unlikely uh, case that a corner column would collapse. Then the whole thing will stay stable. On this beam, span to the uh, core, we have um, ceiling elements, which are composite elements consisting of 16 centimeters CLT, cross laminated timber made of Austrian spruce, with 12 centimeters of concrete slab on it. They are 2 meter 40 wide, 7 meter deep. They come ready made on the construction site, were lifted man to man. And then, as you can see, sued together on very um, less points, so we get a minimum on moisture into the construction site. Then the whole thing is useless. The load bearing system on the facade is made of wooden columns, is glued laminated timber, Austrian spruce as well. They are always 40 centimeters deep, and depending on the load they get, the width is different. So on the top floor, we have a width of 32 centimeters. And this goes up to 108 to the ground floor. It's like the logic of a Christmas tree. The facade elements, they're 4 meter 80 wide, 3 meter 50 high. They are ready made as well. They come on the construction sites with the window in there, with the sunscreen in there. They're not load bearing. They just carry their own weight. And this would be a detail. As you can see, in the center, we have the reinforced concrete beam. Here on the right side, the ceiling element, the uh, combined wood and concrete ceiling element is laying on it. And on the outside, we have the facade element, which consists of 14 centimeters CLT and 20 centimeters of thermic isolation layer. And on the outside, we have a curtain wall facade, which is made of uh, a wooden vertical plank facade uh, in the case of the base of the tower and of the lower building. And on the top of the tower, we have a 
at the knit facade, which is somehow an unburnable facade made of plates with different colors and different texture. But the most important thing of this building is on the inside, we have wood as visible building material, ceiling, wall, columns, they're visible. So if you walk through the building, you can touch the wood, you can feel it, you can smell it, you just notice that you're in a wooden house. And from the outside, as you can about orientation, about identification, this is part of the concept of the seatbelt equipment here. And uh, here you can see the strengths of our building. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Oliver, for this very nice presentation. And indeed, I was telling that we are dealing with architects and we really got a lecture on urban innovation and also on all these kinds of uh, in, uh, constructions. I already saw that uh, there is uh, some issues concerning the, 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 the point of hybrid. Maybe a very short question and then we move on. Um, the choice for hybrid construction, so concrete together with wood, is this a choice just for safety reasons or is it more than just that? Um, it's a, first of all, it's a choice that you use each material that it can fill the best uh, of its uh, capability. Yeah. So yeah. this is this is the main idea behind it. Yeah. You yeah. you won't take a, a glass roof because it makes no sense. Yeah. You don't uh, make a, a, a curtain wall made of of pure uh, copper or whatever. Yeah. You use the material so it could, could fit best into the requirements. That's the most important thing. And out of it, of course, it comes, uh, the result is more safety. If you make a core made of reinforced concrete, of course, uh, if you have a high tower, high rise building, uh, there is no possibility that it burns inside. So it's more safe than if you make it in pure wood. Thanks a lot. We will continue the discussion later on. And uh, we move to the second architect, and this is Daniel Meyer. Uh, he holds a degree in civil engineering um, as well as the ETH in Zurich. He founded Luchinger and uh, Meyer AG together with Paul Luchinger in 1995. And from 2002 to 2010, he was a lecturer in structural glass engineering and head of the competence center of facade and lightweight construction at the Luzern University of Applied Sciences and uh, Arts. So we're moving a little bit more to the facade business, etc. Since 2011, he has been teaching and researching in the field of structural engineering, especially in the field of timber hybrid structures at the University of Applied Sciences and Arts in Winterthur, also in Switzerland. In addition, uh, Luchinger und Meyer has been a co-owner and partner of the Timber Design Studio TSD in Melbourne since 2020. So although we go now to Switzerland, I must say we have also a very strong link to Australia. So Daniel, you have the floor. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I hope you see my, uh, my slides. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to my presentation. And before I show you some uh, project, I want to show you two projects. Uh, I want to say something about our attitude and opinion uh, to sustainability. Uh, we often rely on the primary materials. In our case, often this is timber and their physical as well as aesthetic properties. But we also think of highlighting their qualities by combining them in unexpected ways, hybrid structures, to create truly exceptional, efficient and economical structures. Our goal is always to develop sustainable, clear, and economical structural concepts. For us, sustainability in load beam structure means not only the use of timber and the resulting savings in green energy, but also the following important aspects. Robustness and long life cycles. Uh, we are convinced that structures of buildings, uh, for the, they are not only uh, designed for 60 years, 
Is it, is it possible, in fact, is it possible to design it for more than 150 years? In this case, if we do that like that, we can uh, significantly reduce the rate of demolition of buildings and the carbon emission. The second point, very important, we hear it, uh, we hear it already, is the flexibility of use. So for example, if we designing a building, we have to ensure that uh, a change from an office use to an uh, apartment use has to be possible. Then a uh, very, very important thing for us as structural engineers is a structurally optimized low beam structure with efficient load transfer. Here we have really to remind us to the fathers of structures, engineers, structural engineers from the 20th centuries, which design structures with very, very little use of materials. So we have to learn, we have to look to them, and we have really to optimize the material use for our new buildings we can do. Then another point, prefabrication to optimize transports and a simple deconstruction way that we can reuse our material that we use for the first building, so we can use it for the second building after 150 years, for example. And then what is also important that we have always a system separation, structure and building services. So the building services has not to be integrated, for example, in slabs. So it must be a separate, separate uh, thing for that. So in this equilibrium of low tech and high tech drives us in all projects by combining timber construction with other materials where it leaves its structural sense. In this way, structures are created that meet all the requirements and represent a clear added value for the client. I will shortly show you the, or say you or tell you about something about the hybrid structure definition. It comes from the word, uh, from the Latin word hybrida means bastard. So it is a combination from at least two technologies. And if uh, we are, we uh, have a friction locked uh, system between the materials, so we call this a, comp a composite structure. That mean if some forces goes out from one material to another material, so we have a shear uh, transfer, then we is a hybrid, but also a composite structure. That is more a definition. Uh, only short that uh, in Switzerland, like in other countries in the Europe and all over the world, we have an increasing timber demand. And since 2010, the use of timber has more than doubled in Switzerland. And uh, the mainly uh, used uh, wood in Switzerland is spruce. So I want to start to show you uh, also a high-rise building, uh, the new Tilia Tower in Lausanne. Lausanne is situated at the uh, Geneva Lake in the French-speaking part of Switzerland. Uh, we won together with the architects 3XN from uh, Denmark, from Copenhagen, we won this competition and we are now in the designing and tendering phase of the project. It is uh, one of the highest uh, timber building in Switzerland, the highest uh, building in Lausanne, 85 meter height. We have uh, four floors uh, the base, in, in the basement, uh, which are in concrete uh, due to the span we hear we need to use the, the public use. There's also a cinema. Uh, inside, uh, there are some shops inside. And uh, so in this case, we decided to do that uh, in a concrete, in a massive uh, construction. And the upper floors, uh, which contains hotel and apartments, uh, they are in a, they are built in a, in a hybrid structure with a lot of timber. You see here uh, 
we are located close to a small uh, station from Lausanne, Capri di Male, and uh, the project contains three buildings. Two of them are existing, uh, a gym hall, a badminton hall, an existing office building, which will be refurbished, and the new Tilia Tower. Interesting was that was a competition, and we are the only team uh, with, uh, with a hybrid structure proposal. And uh, I think that we won uh, the competition not only with the expressive and nice architecture, also uh, with this panel I show you that uh, we can really we show that we can uh, reduce the amount of concrete immensely. Uh, and we have a reduction of more than 6,000 ton carbon. And what is also impressive, because at, uh, if we use wood, so we have less cell white. And you see that in the foundation, for example, the foundation, uh, we save more than 20% of, uh, of uh, concrete. Uh, so you see at the end, uh, we have on the one side a very economical building, and on the other side, we can have really a huge reduction of uh, carbon. As I mentioned, uh, we, we, we will also optimize every member of these buildings, every structural member, to, 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 uh, with the idea to, uh, to use as less material as possible. So we do that with high engineering, for example, here a picture within wind engineering. We do that with the CFD analysis, analysis to really optimize uh, everything in the, in the building. Another topic is uh, if it's the fire resistance of the building. Here we have the requirement of a fire resisting of 90 minutes. And we solve this on the one side with the sprinkler, which reduce, uh, which reduce 30 minutes. And on the other side, we do that by uh, fire calculation. We see here a typical floor this, from this hybrid, uh, for this hybrid uh, ceiling. You see the blue line, the blue lines, there are uh, supporting beams. These beams are uh, in steel, they are delta beams. Uh, we do that uh, because we have the possibility to have, a, we have then a flat uh, ceilings, flat slabs, and, and we have a better utilization of the space. You see here a section, a section through the, the slab construction, uh, the timber beams and uh, then partial prefabricated uh, concrete slabs. Uh, it's the same thing. We have a little bit the same idea like the project we saw uh, uh, from Vienna. Then here see another section. Uh, here also the balcony, the outside balcony they are prefabricated. Uh, they are connected with the inner with the inner layer. You see here uh, also in this section these uh, delta beams in steel which are integrated uh, in the slab. Then the facade, the facade also the facade consists uh, is consisting of uh, CLT, CLT wood timber and. Uh, prefabricated light white uh, concrete elements and insulated glass sheets. So I want to jump a little bit in another part of the world, to Australia, where we are working together with the Timber Design Studio on some really exciting uh, timber buildings. In general, the timber construction in Australia is still it's in its infancy. In 2016 and 2019, changes were made to the National Construction Code of Australia that specifically provided legal guidance regarding multi-story residential timber constructed buildings under deemed to satisfy provisions. Since then, 
since then the timber market is increasingly unstoppable. You see that in this uh, diagram that in the last uh, five years or 10 years, we have a really uh, increasing, immense increasing of uh, timber buildings. I want to show you shortly a really interesting building, the new Atlassian Tower in Sydney. Uh, this building is designed by shop architects in New York uh, in collaboration with uh, the engineers Eckersley O'Callaghan from London. We, uh, as TDS, uh, we are working on site of the, uh, of the client. We are consultant uh, for the timber structure. In terms of the requirement of the city compaction, we have uh, all over the world, the demand of high-rise building is very high. And in this case, I want to show you a really interesting building with a different approach of hybrid, of, uh, hybrid buildings. Personally, I think the timber has some physical limits. Daniel, Daniel, can I ask you to come a little bit to the conclusions in function of time? To, yes, to, I do uh, that. A little bit. Sorry for the interruption. Yes. Sorry for that. Yeah. So I think the timber has, uh, has uh, the physical limits. Uh, and I'm convinced that for the moment that uh, buildings higher than 100 meters will be not uh, economically in a, in a timber structure, main structure. And this idea of the hybrid here lies that we have an uh, exoskeleton and a bracing core in concrete and, uh, and uh, steel. And then we generate some compartments. Uh, and these compartments, they are filled up with, uh, with timber with timber structures. So you see here, we have these uh, mega floors uh, with the fire resistance about 180 minutes, and then filled up by a uh, proper uh, timber structure in skeleton or in bulkhead design for, uh, for, the, for, the, for the apartments or for the offices. And uh, so if, for example, one compartment is collapsing, the mega floors can resist and absorb the collapse of, uh, all, uh, of all the weight of, the, of an a compartment. Here you see the typical floor of a wooden structure, easily done, uh, normal steel T uh, ceilings, spruce. Then we have some frays from frame. Uh, with the span about nine meters, also with spruce. Here you see a section through a compartment with some camp delivering parts. And with this uh, picture, uh, which shows the inner life of the structure, uh, I will end my presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for this very nice presentation. And indeed, it was nice to show the last uh, a few slides with a very nice building and uh, the nice environment as well. I will skip my first, I have a lot of questions, but I will uh, skip it a little bit in view of uh, time. And in that way, I um, would like to move on to the next um, speaker, which is again an architect, but this is an architect working in a research institute. So we are making now slowly the link between wood science and wood-based construction technology. Andrea Stocchero is the portfolio leader for trees to high value wood products. Here you see indeed, we start from the trees and we go to the wood products and is the sustainability architect at Scion. And now we move to New Zealand. So we are not stopping in Australia, we are even going further to New Zealand. And um, Scion is the, um, the Crowns Research Institute for forestry, wood products, wood derived materials and other biomaterial sectors. Andrea's research activities focus on wood and bioproducts innovations for low carbon design and construction, circular regenerative built environment and communities. He is an architect and he represented New Zealand 
um, at uh, the inter and the international timber design and construction sector at the United Nations Forest Bioeconomy Forum. Andrea will speak us today about wood innovations back to the bio future. Andrea, you have the floor. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm sharing my presentation. I hope you can see my screen. And uh, I uh, want to start uh, thanking you, Ludo, Yuka, Matthias, and the World Bioeconomy Forum for having me here today. And uh, uh, I want to thank you, everyone, for being here today with us. So kia ora tatau. Greetings to all of us from Aotearoa, New Zealand. Uh, today, I wish to provide some insights about the opportunities that would offer to build a sustainable bio future. Wood is one of the oldest building materials, as uh, um, Oliver was uh, mentioning already. We could also say that uh, using wood is one of the uh, humanities traditions. It has been used across time and places to build buildings, objects, and tools. These three buildings here represent uh, um, different cultures and construction approaches, but they all have in common wood. With the advent of the industrial age, the industrial revolution, innovations in structural materials and technologies, such as reinforced concrete and steel, enabled to push the boundaries of design creativity and engineering solutions. Over the last two centuries, we have seen architectural styles influenced by those materials and uh, new buildings that were ongoingly breaking the limits of uh, possible. The advent of industrialization also coincided with a spike of anthropogenic carbon emissions. According to the United Nations, 11% of current global emissions are directly or indirectly related to building materials. The UN also suggests that uh, when we need to scale up adoption of nature-based solutions in construction if we want to meet the global climate targets. Wood construction today is very different to the past. Wood today is engineered into a wide range of high-tech and high-performing products. The integration of these products with digital design and manufacturing, modular prefabrication, is enabling new timber construction horizons and the performing bio-based solutions for building sustainably. Wood can be manufactured into a variety of building products from structural materials to interior and, and exterior products and even insulation. Wood can be grown and regrown in sustainably managed forests that contribute to many ecosystem services to deliver environmental sustainability and social well-being for local communities. I wish here to mention the effect that living uh, in wood environments have on people. Many studies around the world have found that uh, individuals of all ages have positive neurological be in the form of less stress, lower blood pressure, more relaxation or, and positive moods, and increased concentration, level of concentration. This is explained by the concept of biophilia, which uh, describes humans in a need to be in contact with nature. Wood comes from nature and somehow it reconnects us with nature, uh, consciously or subconsciously. However, like nature, it needs to be respected and protected. Wood is an organic material prone to decay induced by moisture, fungi, and pests. Wood is combustible. Due to these risks, it is of a popular perception that timber buildings are less durable and unsafe from fire compared to alternative forms of construction. Also, it is commonly assumed that using wood contributes to the first station. However, any building material can fail. These are some famous examples of building disasters due to fires, loss of structural performance due to decay, or design and construction failures. Best practices in timber design, in, in timber construction, and in building operations and maintenance can ensure that uh, timber buildings are safe and last longer, even for centuries, 
and we saw some examples today already. And this is valid for any other material. We need to design and build and maintain the buildings properly and accordingly to the materials needs. Also, we can grow and harvest wood uh, in a sustainable way. The same physical characteristics that make wood uh, subject to those risks, the fact that it is an organic uh, porous and fibrous material, are also the characteristics that make wood easy to be modified, treated, and engineered to enhance its performance. This can happen through a variety of thermochemical and mechanical processes. Here I am showing only a few of the many innovative wood products and modification techniques that my colleagues here at SIM have been developing. For example, wood that is colored through its full thickness for better aesthetic results, reduce maintenance needs for, for products in use, or even to mimic uh, the aesthetic appearance of endangered exotic wood species that should not be harvested. Wood that is uh, instead decolored to the point that it is becoming transparent and then densified to be made uh, significantly stronger. Wood fibers that can be blended with plastics and bioplastics for strengthening uh, the, pr the plastic products and reducing their weight. Or biobase and biodegradable 3D printing filaments for additive manufacturing. Or lastly, uh, the example of a biobase, fully biobase, 100% biobase adhesives that also minimize the volatile organic compound emissions to enable healthier indoor environments. But it is important to remember and to note that uh, all parts of a tree can be used to resource a huge variety of products that can support a circular bioeconomy. Sustainably managed forests, therefore, can be considered as a renewable mine or a well for bioresources of the present and for the future. Going back to construction, uh, these are just a couple of uh, examples of innovative engineering products uh, developed in New Zealand. Uh, Optimize Engineer Lumber on the left is uh, a product which uh, uh, is um, manufactured by digitally grading and arranging individual lamellas from short rotation forests and lower quality trees to create high performing structural products. In return, this can also increase the capacity of our forests to regenerate resources more quickly, faster. On the right hand side, uh, there is screw laminated hardwood timber, which has been uh, uh, arranged uh, in a uh, structural shell uh, that is providing enhanced performance and enhanced aesthetic. Hardwood is very hard to manufacture into bended uh, shapes and, uh, and to laminate. And this was a clever solution to achieve that. Here we have two different examples of uh, plywood-based modular structures designed to minimize waste, material waste, and increase speed and the quality of construction, reducing building costs and uh, also the environmental impacts due to the efficient use of materials and resources. And this is a bigger scale example. This is a, a design innovation hub, which is called Tefare Nuyo to Teata. The building where I'm currently sitting and talking from. The three story engineered timber structure of this building is composed by a prefabricated timber diamond elements, which are forming a diagonal grid or diagrid structure. This structure provides strength and stiffness using less material. The timber diamonds are assembled using timber to timber connections which uh, enable to minimize the use of steel connectors. This enable to optimize in the use of steel and concrete only to where they perform best. The tall timber diamonds are connected using uh, sacrificial steel elements that are designed to deform and dissipate uh, lateral loads from earthquake solicitations. And during sever severe earthquake events, they minimize damage to the building. This means that these elements uh, will deform, but are easily replaceable and economically replaceable, which means that we don't need to demolish the building due to 
heavy damage on the structure after a severe earthquake. But importantly, the building timber structure is storing nearly 420 tons of uh, CO2, which was previously sequestered by trees growing in New Zealand forests. This carbon is going to be locked out of the atmosphere uh, in the building, while trees replanting in sustainably managed forests uh, will keep the sequestration going. We calculated that New Zealand planted forests have the capacity to regrow the net amount of structural wood uh, used in this building in only 35 minutes. This is showing the regenerative potential of uh, our forest resource and how we can uh, um, cleverly use the materials efficiency, efficiently. Using wood as much as possible meant that we avoided higher carbon emission compared to using alternative structural materials. And an LCA life cycle assessment study confirmed that the carbon stored in the timber structure offset the emissions from all the building materials, providing a neutral carbon footprint from an embodied carbon perspective. So I wish to conclude this presentation citing the Economic Promotion Agency of Luxembourg, uh, which uh, referenced wood, to, uh, it wood as the oldest construction material of the future. I really like this definition. If we want to fight climate change and contribute meeting the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, it is becoming very urgent that the international construction sector, the government bodies and communities will understand that huge the huge benefits and potential of wood-based construction and innovative wood products. And it is important that they will support the transition to a circular and low carbon bioeconomy with their consumer choices, policies, and decision-making. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, uh, Andrea, for this very nice presentation. You touched health effects, you touched engineering, you touched uh, the climate effects, but also you showed us that wood can be used even as transparent wood in 3D printing, etc. And maybe a very short question uh, about these last ones. Do you think that this, the, the fact that we can manipulate now wood in all kinds of directions uh, will be a driver for the, the public to accept wood as, as a new uh, system in, in fashion and in uh, sustainable construction systems? Can it play a role there? <clears throat> I, I do think that uh, what will uh, drive the demand from the public is the awareness and understanding of the public of the urgency of making choices related to the environmental sustainability of bio-based products, not only wood, but uh, the capacity of wood to be uh, stretched into a variety of products and forms uh, will make possible to substitute uh, many products from uh, uh, fossil raw materials. Uh, not everyone in the community is really keen to, uh, to um, understand the nature of the, the materials uh, that are making the products that we need in our lives. But uh, so to some extent, some people will never care about the material, but what they care is about the product. So if industry can actually have a bio-based substitute, which is uh, as efficient, as effective, as performing, or even better than uh, synthetic non-renewable materials, well, that's the win uh, for the bioeconomy and the biofuture and, and wood. We will certainly continue this discussion because I see in the chat a lot of things happening on, on this uh, point and also on wood availability. These are the points that are easy, really um, popping up uh, now. It's time to move now to the other side of, of the, the globe. And so we move to Ion de la Roche. He's adjunct uh, professor at the University of British Columbia, so in Canada, and he's plant genetist geneticist emerged uh, in his uh, career all the three Canadian Forest Research Institute into the famous FP innovations, making it at the time the world's largest private forest products research institute. I know personally also very well FP innovations and they are really doing a great job. So thanks a lot for this merging. I think it really makes sense to integrate all these things. Um, yeah, 
Dr. De La Rocha has remained actively engaged in the forest sector as a professor in forestry at the university and as a business consultant working with clients from governments and several international forest product companies. He will speak to us today about sustainable wood construction in North America. Ion, you have the floor. Thank you. I'm just trying to get this thing organized here. Uh, can I get my slides up? Let me see. Uh, we, you started screen sharing, but we don't see them yet. No, oh boy. Let me go back here. Are they, can you see them? No, not yet. Okay. This is not a good start here. Let me just go here. Uh, screen sharing. Oh, boy. Um, oh. Otherwise, I will ask Tammy to to share it, and then you can just ask her to click. Yeah, we might have to do that. I don't know why I'm having this problem. Uh, Tammy, can you help and just share the slides of Ian? Have you got it, Tammy? Uh, there they are. Okay. So if, we, if we put them in slideshow, we can start. Okay, please do. Can you do that? Have you got it? We got it. Okay. Perfect. All right. Good. Okay. So thanks, Ludo. I'll move on this quickly since I've had a bad start. Uh, no can you see the outline of my presentation? It's great. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, three issues. I'm going to talk about the uh, uh, trends driving global demand for affordable and environmentally sustainable housing. Uh, and then I'll drill down into wood construction and show how it helps meet our commitment to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And I'll end by highlighting some recent technologies and innovations that are helping redefine the building uh, with wood space. Uh, let, let's look briefly at uh, some of the global trends. Um, uh, the first one is around population growth. Uh, as most of us are aware, by the end of the century, the world population is expected to increase uh, from about 7.6 billion today to about 11.8. That's a 55% increase. Uh, and uh, this increase will create a, a strong demand for housing, particularly in the least developed countries. Uh, in the less developed countries, there is a growing affluence, and with that has come a need for shelters that are of better quality, more affordable, and more environmentally sustainable. In fact, the UN has uh, indicated that we will need to create about 3 billion new housing units by 2030. Turning now to urbanization, uh, briefly, uh, we've seen strong trends towards urbanization globally. In, for instance, in 1950, 30% uh, of the population lived in cities, and by, 20, uh, by 2005, this had increased to 50%. Uh, uh, by, uh, uh, and by 2050, uh, we, we expect an increase of 70%. This densification will drive increased demand for taller multifamily structures. The other area is, of course, uh, uh, the housing demand as a result of climate-related disturbances. And this is becoming more and more uh, um, uh, important uh, year by year. Uh, it's occurring, these events are occurring more frequently and they're having much larger economic impact. And obviously this is gonna be a major uh, impact on housing needs going forward. The last area that I just wanted to uh, a flag and it was address, uh, addressed a bit by Andrea uh, is just to flag the growing emphasis that we're seeing on aesthetics uh, uh, of, uh, and the biophilic attributes of buildings. And of course, wood fits that uh, need very, uh, very importantly. There's been a lot of data recently that has shown that wood built environments enhance physical as well as mental health, as Andrea uh, mentioned. I'll turn now to uh, the next slide. Uh, Everybody see it? It's a slide that talks about environmentally sustainable forms of construction used in uh, wood materials, uh, using wood materials. And uh, if we look at a building and their contribution to greenhouse gas emissions, uh, we find that uh, the recent reports from COP21, the IEA, IPCC, have done a very good job in highlighting the challenges around reducing anthropogenic uh, uh, carbon emissions uh, by 2030. And they've also talked 
extensively about the role of, of the important role of growing trees and uh, the, the role also that wood products can play. In fact, we've got to recognize that wood accounts for a tremendous amount of the global carbon emissions each year, between 30 and 40 percent. And so there's tremendous pressure to move to net zero emissions uh, in the building uh, value chain. When we look at carbon emissions in building, and you'll see the slide on the left, uh, we have to consider both embodied energy and operating energy. The embodied energy represents about one third of the carbon dioxide emissions and covers the extraction of, uh, and you'll see that on the right with the uh, life cycle analysis of building products. It, it, it covers the extraction of the resource, the manufacturing of the building material, transportation, and the construction. Operating energy represents an average of two thirds of the carbon emissions over the life of a building. And you'll see that in the slide on the left. Uh, in recent years, designers and contractors have made great strides uh, in energy efficiency. For example, passive house, LEED certifications, etc. As well, governments have uh, introduced generous financial incentives uh, along with building code changes. And a good example of that in British Columbia is the energy step code. Construction materials can be benchmarked also uh, for their embodied energy using life cycle analysis to quantify that impact. And on the bottom left, you see the embodied environmental impacts of various exterior wall assemblies. The orange uh, bar represents wood and you can see wood as compared to the other materials, mainly mainstream steel and various uh, forms of concrete, uh, uh, block, uh, insulated concrete form uh, and, and SIP panels. And you can see clearly uh, in this case that wood-based materials compare very favorably uh, against steel and concrete. Uh, the final slide on the bottom right, uh, and again, it's been mentioned by several of the speakers, is the ability of trees to be unique with respect to being able to sequester atmospheric carbon dioxide and then storing it as wood fiber, which can then be subsequently used and stored as wood structures. This is nature's answer to carbon capture, use, and storage. All of this, which I've talked about, leads to, I think, a three-pronged approach to reach net zero emissions. First one, obviously, is reduce operating energy of buildings. Second one is use more wood materials to minimize embodied energy. The third is to decarbonize the atmosphere by growing more trees and then storing that carbon in wood products and wood buildings. Here are some examples uh, in Canada of uh, uh, exhibiting how mass timber construction can act as a huge storage reservoir for sequestering uh, carbon from the atmosphere. Uh, the one on the left is the 18 story Brook Common residence at UBC. In fact, when it was built in 2017, it was the tallest uh, hybrid wood structure in the world. Uh, it's been surpassed, as we've heard from earlier speakers, by uh, several other uh, initiatives, taller buildings. And the other one is, uh, is, is a 12-story condo in Quebec City. But the important thing about that one is that uh, uh, it, it, it's, it primarily uses entirely wood. So the uh, elevator shaft is not made out of concrete, as is the case uh, on the example on the left. What I'm trying to show here, though, is the tremendous amount of wood that's being used and the impact that has had on carbon benefit. That is the carbon benefit from the carbon stored in the wood, as well as the displacement factor or the avoided greenhouse gas emissions of using wood as compared to other materials. And as you can see, when you look at the volume of wood and the potential carbon benefit, the ratio is roughly one cubic meter of wood is equivalent to uh, to a benefit in carbon of one metric ton of carbon dioxide, quite significant. Governments have played a, a big role in North America uh, in promoting uh, wood from code changes that favor wood to procurement policies and to an advocacy role uh, for using more wood in construction. Uh, the, uh, the rationale, uh, of course, has been motivated by the need to support jobs in the forest-based communities and also recognition of the importance of the forest sector in meeting greenhouse gas reduction targets. 
For example, uh, the uh, building codes in Canada now allow for 12 story mass timber structures and the US codes allow up to 18 stories uh, with certain restrictions. Governments have also, as I mentioned, been aggressive advocates of greater wood use. One example is the wood first procurement policy at uh, British Columbia, in British Columbia. And that's had a major impact on wood construction at my university, University of British Columbia. Also, mass timber construction in Canada has benefited from direct financial support by governments as well as industry associations. So very briefly, uh, looking at technology and innovation. And what we can say is that technology and innovations are making buildings stronger, safer, and taller. And researchers have played an enorm enormously important role in developing relevant technologies and supporting innovations in wood construction. And I've indicated here a short list of some of the enhanced performance attributes that have been worked on and continue to be worked on as top priority. I'll move now to the innovative engineered uh, wood products. Uh, and uh, here uh, on the left, we see a structural, uh, listing of structural composites uh, that are based on lumber, veneer, strand and flake substrates. Uh, these engineered wood products have been critical to the successful renaissance of mass timber construction in North America. And the examples of applications are shown on the right. On the uh, first one on the right is the, of course, uh, application of blue lamb columns and beams. Uh, to, the, uh, to the right of that is uh, nail, nail laminated timber uh, that is being used uh, as an elevator shaft or the, or the central core of the building. And then we have below CLT, cross laminated timber. And the one that's interesting on the right is dowel laminated timber. And this one has a specific application for acoustical properties. We're seeing more wood used in hybrid systems with offsite prefabrication, as you see here. Uh, and this is especially the case for uh, 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 wood uh, hybrid uh, floor systems. Uh, Ian, can you come to the conclusions, please? Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, moving on here. Uh, these are some of the uh, uh, important uh, examples on the UBC campus of hybrids. Uh, we move here to the uh, array of uh, wood construction methods that are available in North America, light wood frame on the left, mass timber, a frame and plates to hybrid. Uh, here is, I think, very important to note. Um, it's the uh, it's the fact that uh, the sweet spot uh, for urban construction in North America now has moved towards mid-rise. That's the six to 12 story range, and it's usually hybrid. And on the left, we see an example of hybrid mid-rise that is using a light wood frame construction. And on the right is mass timber. And the important thing to know here is the layout of this, which really emphasizes the biophilic nature uh, of it. And this is uh, very popular now with uh, knowledge uh, intensive companies that uh, uh, are interested in promoting greater uh, uh, interaction of environment as well as uh, the, uh, uh, the greater creativity that they expect from this kind of environment. The last slide really is just to show how uh, technology is improving uh, productivity in the wood sector. Uh, as you can see from the slide on the left, the figures, uh, manufacturing has been very successful uh, particularly those companies that have exploited uh, disruptive technologies over the last 15 years, it's, it's roughly doubled, whereas the construction that you see in the blue has, uh, as an industry has lang languished uh, and in fact probably decreased. Now that's being changed through technology and what we're seeing here is uh, technology platforms being used uh, that uh, capitalize on uh, the value chain integration and optimization right from the planning design through prefabrication uh, through onto assembly. Uh, this, uh, th this optimization of the value chain makes it uh, very suitable to be inserting in uh, uh, new technologies, uh, exploiting digitization and robotics, for example, uh, in this kind of system. I'll end by four takeaway messages. The first being that there's a growing global demand for affordable, safe, and healthy and environmental sustainable shelters worldwide, as I mentioned earlier. There's a growing interest in wood construction in North America because of its environmental, aesthetic, and biophilic attributes, as well as other attributes that I've mentioned. 
And the third thing is the explosion of new and innovative wood products and applications that I've shown. And the very important last factor is government has a very strong role to play in this. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Ian, and sorry for um, interrupting you to, to hurry up That's a little bit. <laughs> sorry for that. Okay. Um, no so I think I, I have um, a lot of questions again, and I have a very important question about uh, woodway availability, but there are so many questions on that that we will keep that uh, in the panel. So um, in view of time, I would like to stay in the Americas, but now to go completely from the north completely south and we go to, uh, to Chile. And there I would like to present you uh, Bruno Gorini. He is doctor in science and chemical engineering since 93. He has worked in the wood panels industry in different companies in North and South America and the last 13 years in Arauco in Chile as a principal research researcher in bioforest, which is an R&D subsidiary company from Arauco, where he, he has formed the new research and development division in wood panels. So now we will really go to the chemicals and the wood panels, but what we all need in all these kinds of constructions. So the last years he focused on the development of adhesives, adhesives coming from trees uh, for all types of boards uh, and wood protection based on renewable materials like lignin, tannin, nanocellulose, among others. Bruno will speak about sustainable biomaterials for wood panel adhesives. Bruno, you have the floor. Thank you, Ludo. Hello to everybody. And thank you for to be here today in this forum. Um, today, the wood panel industry is using mainly adhesive coming from natural gas and petroleum because they are cheap, have fast curing rate, colorless, and it's possible to obtain very good property on the final product. Uh, but the wood panel industry required the introduction of more em environmental, finally adhesive, due to strict current regulations in, on formaldehyde based emission and also for sustainability. Key drivers for bioadhesive are shown in this slide, and uh, there are more pressure to increase to be sustainable, and also the circular economy play a role. And we know that uh, the longer lasting the product, the better it is for the climate mitigation. It is crucial that uh, when building a sustainable economy, we optimize the use of wood in line with the cascading principle. This means that wood should be used as much as possible for long life uh, materials and products to substitute the carbon intensive and fossil based counterparts like steel, plastic, and concrete, concrete that you can find in furniture and also in buildings. The purpose of this uh, presentation is to show you the industrial and laboratory results of four different bioadhesives as option to the most conventional fossil resins used in the production of wood panels. Um, here you can see the natural polymers are material coming from renewable research and the uh, bio-based wood adhesive with the the, the big challenge is to get the same bonding performance and cost than the actual synthetic adhesive. And also the sustainable adhesive should be not only available at low cost, it's necessary, it's necessary also to, to be easily su the, the supplied and also have a very high reactivity and long pot life. Uh, here you can see different polymer or different raw material used to produce a bio-based adhesive, like a saccharide basis, for example, cellulose or starch, in the case of aromatic bases like lignin and tannin. Um, advantage and disadvantage you can see for different biopolymer like lignin, tannin, protein, and starch. Lignin, for example, is 
available, low cost, but had some disadvantage like uh, the low reactivity, and for that require modification, and that means uh, more cost in the in the production of this type of uh, um, adhesive. Here is I show you the chemical structure of three different uh, material that we well, polymers that we have used to produce our uh, own adhesive. Um, I will refer now a uh, sample, industrial example from each of them. For example, here you can see picture of the industrial production of plywood using a uh, bioadhesive containing 60% of adhesive of, of tannin replacing the phenol, keeping the same property of the final product. You can see blending with using extruders, pre-press, multi-opening press, and the final product there with the same property than the actual standard private board. Also, we use tanning, for example, here to, to, to produce a laboratory scale uh, um, particle board without formaldehyde, without any uh, chemical there, using two uh, cross linker. Um, and you can see, for example, the, the internal bond that is a measure of the um, performance of the resin is higher than the actual urea formaldehyde resin that we use in the production. Here, yeah, just to show you that is a very efficient adhesive. Also, uh, in this case, uh, we have produced some resin, uh, reinforced the actual resin with the uh, nanocellulose and other uh, compound materials. But here, the goal, the goal is not to um, substitute completely the resin, yeah, it's just to reduce the consumption. And we we'll obtain with 2% for nanocellulose, the reinforcement of the UF resin Will be, it was possible to decrease until 20% the resin consumption. That is something that uh, is useful for the carbon footprint of the product and also for the production cost. And uh, here, finally, to show we are already start with the use of lignin in, in industrial scale and some of the board we are doing partially step by step and we can keep uh, this example is uh, adhesive uh, with 20% of lignin inside. We know that science and other uh, company in, in Europe also are using more than 50 or more of lignin in the, in the resin, but it's possible to, move, to show you that the industrial production is possible and new product with less carbon footprint. As a conclusion, we can say that uh, there are a lot of operations today to reduce the, or to eliminate or change the actual synthetic adhesive. Uh, Nanocellulose, lignin and tannin could be used as natural, sustainable to reinforce or substitute traditional resins. There is a lot of uh, research still necessary to do in order to, to clarify some uh, question, for example, the long life or the bottle life or the, the life of the final product if we send to the recycling, for example, or to the landfill. Uh, but we are pretty sure that in the near future uh, will we'll, we have available natural biodiesel for all type of boards. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Bruno, for this um, very interesting presentation on the adhesives. Um, just a short question before we move to the panel. Do you think that the, the fact that these adhesives are bio-based um, is really making a, a difference for the consumers um, in the future? Uh, do they really want to have something which is already bio or wood panel, but where they are concerned about the, the full availability 
of, of the 100%, let me say, uh, bio-based um, material. Uh, will it play a role at a, on a commercial scale as well, or economically? Um, today, uh, what we show here is uh, some result with the same performance that the um, actual synthetic adhesive, and also it has also a, some uh, economic uh, economic uh, advantage. Um, today, uh, norm normally the customer want bio-based product, but at the same price. That's it, the, the, the big challenge that we have today. But it's a, a way to, uh, to use as a marketing in order to prefer your product. Uh, and also, it's necessary to show that the bio-based adhesives are more uh, healthy for the for the humans, and um, that will be also I, probably a difference for the future. So we already discussed about this biophilia, which was a new word for me today. And I think this the fact that we can avoid these uh, typical phenol formaldehyde uh, emissions okay. by by lignin formaldehyde the uh, formaldehyde emissions will really. Uh, bring also something on indoor air quality, etc. Thanks a lot, uh, Bruno. And may I invite now all the panelists to put on their cameras and mics so that we can move on to the to the panel discussion. And one of my first points would be that uh, we really had uh, great examples of of wood based constructions. We saw it is sustainable. We saw a lot of things about the climate issues, carbon sinks, etc. It looks very nice. We had the uh, the new word biophilia. Um, we, we had uh, really a lot of, of, of different possibilities. But then we see also that uh, people get a little bit concerned. Uh, is there enough wood to proceed with this business? Um, how do you see this in the world? I started by saying that there is a... Uh, a scientific study by uh, the ETH in Zurich that there is a huge capacity of extra wood that can be added on the planet and it really will, will create a lot of possibilities. But in the same time, um, can we now already move on or do we have to wait until this uh, huge amount of, of wood is uh, afforested? Um, so what is the idea? Maybe to start with a little bit uh, to uh, Ian, because I, I could not, uh, due to time constraints, ask this question. Two days ago, I participated in another panel in, in function of the paper week in Canada. And there they were speaking about BDO zones. And I, I read it, a BDO zone is a bioeconomy development opportunity zone. And these are zones in Canada that do have excess of biomass available for the market. So in fact, there is an excess and they are looking for a market. Um, I don't know if you are aware of that, but is this an opportunity for, for more wood-based constructions? Uh, can you yeah, say that? Yeah, I, I could comment on that. Um, really, basically, it's not only in Canada. This is an effort or initiative in both the United States and Canada. Exactly. Uh, which is important to note, but the focus is really basically on residual biomass, and it's 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 really looking at it as a potential feedstock for the biorefinery in the traditional way, uh, uh, rather than and goes beyond traditional wood products and pulp and paper. So we're talking about solid and liquid biofuels, biochemicals, and biomaterials, other than the two I just mentioned, the traditional ones. Uh, there's gonna be challenges though, and the challenge has always been the cost to extract and transport these uh, residuals, whether they're from the roadside after harvesting or within the forest as residues. Uh, I, I, it's really based or built, I think, on the uh, DOE report of 2016, which they talked about the billion ton challenge. And now we're talking about in a global sense, is there enough wood uh, available? And uh, uh, so that's essentially in a nutshell where I think that's coming from. Thanks, uh, Ion. So maybe to the, the different architects, if you're speaking to the, to the public about these buildings, um, are you also confronted with this idea, oh, you were destroying the forests, uh, what's going on and, and what can be the answer or how can we solve this, uh, this tension? We all understand that a wooden construction is very healthy, is nice, etc. But people are also concerned, 
And for instance, also in Europe, we have now the, the new um, um, forestry forest strategy. And there it is accepted that we go for a bioeconomy strongly that we use wood, etc. But in the same time, there is a lot of concern about biodiversity. So how do the architects look to this um, tension? Who wants to be first? <laughs> okay, Oliver. Okay, uh, it's very easy if you come from Austria because Austria is a very wood rich country. So yeah. half of our area is, is, is forest. Um, and this leads to the point that we have a, a huge surplus of wood every year. The problem is this is not only uh, the, the wood you need for building products. This is different type of wood. Yeah? It's just biomass. So the problem we are facing right now is, in fact, the climate change. So everybody knows nowadays or in the, the, the recent status is that everything is based on, on um, pine or it's um, spruce, which is where the, the, the wood construction, the constructive wood construction is made of. And uh, nowadays the nine degree Celsius uh, borderline is rising up. Yeah? So this is the major problem for uh, spruce and for pine. And uh, this leads us to the point that uh, the forest is with the, the, the monoculture forest yeah, is in danger. And uh, we have to find different trees which can take this. The problem is it's a long-term thing. Yeah? So if we decide today we make different trees, it lasts about 50, 80, whatever years that we can harvest them. Yeah? And this is a little bit, this is, of course, it's... Uh, it's a danger we are facing, and uh, the industry is working on this. We, 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 they did try to, to do something with birch or whatever, but this is not uh, because the moisture it is very sensitive to moisture, so it's very hard to bring it in into a, a building structure. Thanks a lot. Um, I, in fact, you are all three coming from a quite um, forested uh, country, and maybe uh, I can move to uh, Andrea as well. So um, we are speaking about wood, but you also could uh, show us that uh, uh, in a lot of cases, we just need smaller structures like uh, cellulose, etc., to use. Can you emphasize a little bit on that? Uh, well, in, in order to maximize the opportunity to use the resource and the efficiency in using the resource, we need to find design solutions and manufacturing solutions and materials that are delivering higher performance uh, with, with less material. Um, and in this way, we will be able to uh, make the most out of resources. There were some examples in my presentation uh, about uh, using uh, plywood uh, uh, to um, and, and CNC manufacturing and digital fabrication to reduce waste. Uh, the, the, the building where I'm talking uh, is uh, um, designed upon the, the, the quest of uh, minimizing the use of wood while maximizing the amount of wood compared to other materials. And in this way, we were able to deliver a structure with a reduced quantity of wood but a minimized quantity of, of other materials. This is important. But most importantly, in relation to the question of uh, how do we source wood sustainably, uh, there are certification protocols for um, sustainable management of forests, which uh, are currently uh, looking at a variety of, of parameters about uh, uh, how forests are managed, grown, harvested, and how biodiversity and local communities are protected Protect and improved by forest reparations. Uh, so when we are specifying wood, when we are sourcing wood, it is very important to uh, make sure that we are sourcing wood uh, which is uh, sustainably certified and, uh, and that the chain of custody of the wood uh, is uh, complete from the forest to the actual product. Thanks a lot. Um, let me, yeah, Ian wants to, okay, Ian. Yeah, just very briefly, I just wanted to build on that. I, I, I think what we've done is a good job at looking at the life cycle analysis from the context of the extraction of the resource going through the full cycle. And what we've missed is actually casting back a little further uh, to, uh, uh, to the actual growing of more trees, 
of practicing rigorous forest management, etc. So that whole aspect of broadening that uh, life cycle is becomes more and more important. And I don't think we've done as good a job uh, uh, in, in terms of bringing in the forest and sustainability in a full chain of custody as we, we, we could have. And I think we've got to put greater emphasis on that going forward. Yeah. So in that way, I think it really makes sense to bring this into uh, the, a discussion with this prediction that we can uh, increase strongly via afforestation, a lot of uh, forests in the world, etc. So this really makes sense. I think, Bruno, you wanted to, to mention something as well. I know that um, uh, Chile is uh, um, having an also a growth of his forests compared in the complete opposite way to, to Brazil, if I can say. And so uh, in, in, in your case, uh, what is your opinion about this availability of wood? Regarding wood availability, at least in Chile, there is a, a proposal to increase the area of plantations as part of Chile's goals to mitigate the climate change. But this change from country to country for sure. I believe in that in some case there is a no restriction or increase for increasing the forest area. But there is a competition for sure between the two use of goods, keeping the forest standing or using the wood for construction. Uh, I think this will be linked to the carbon market. Uh, if they incri increase the price of the carbon, it will be more convenient not to harvest. And that can have an, an impact for sure in the availability, availability of wood. So this is for sure one of the big points. And I think uh, we will need further discussions in further uh, round tables of the World Bioeconomy Forum to, to discuss further on this uh, tension. Maybe to turn back a little bit to the discussion of today, and I would like to, uh, to ask first to Daniel. Um, we learned a lot about um, these wooden, wooden constructions. Also, in many times, it was mentioned hybrid structures and also modular structures. How do you see that these structures do have or do can, can play a role in circularity? At the end of life of a certain system, can it be reused? Um, because when I think on a, on a hybrid structure or on what I call a multi-material, so a material, for instance, that is composed of concrete, wood, and steel. At the end of life, I think, oh, boys, we have to, to disassemble everything in order to reuse it, etc. Mm -hmm. So how, does, uh, how do you look to, to this uh, circular approach, if you want? Yes, I mean, it's a good question. So I think... Uh... What we have to look one that, especially if we do it in a, in hybrid structure, that we are really thinking in future how we can simply de 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 deconstruct it. So we have we, we are also do research for uh, exploring new fittings, how we can put together, for example, concrete with timber, and at the end of the life we can only solve some uh, some screws and then we have the timber beam and we have the concrete slab so that we are looking for and what is important thing i'm convinced that in the reuse that we can use after 100 years i say especially a beam a timber beam we can use it in a in another construction i'm i'm convinced that is not the end of uh, this uh, of this beam but what we have to do, that is also in, if we do a new building, I think we need an inventory about everything in the building. That if we do a new building, we have to, uh, we, we say we have these beams with this uh, resistance, with, uh, that we have like an inventory. And at the end of the life of this building, we have all data. That is not the problem we have if we do reuse and we want to, for example, use old steel beams. We don't have any data about that. And so I think it is very interesting now to start to build up this, this inventory of data, of structure that we know in 100 years uh, that we can use it uh, for this material. So that could be an approach to that. 
I think there is another famous um, Swiss, uh, Swiss architect, Thomas Rau, who is speaking about these um, building passports, etc. And I think this is really gaining a lot of interest in, in Europe, at least in view of circularity, to go to these uh, passports where we make an inventory of everything that can be reused uh, at the end of life of the systems. Mm -hmm. Are there any other comments on the circularity of uh, buildings? Oliver? At the moment, I need the passport for all the materials. This is the worst case already. I think we as architects, we have to start before. We have to build buildings. You can change to use it lifelong. We have a very interesting example in Vienna. It's called Gründerzeit. These are buildings which were uh, erected in the 1850s, last uh, the, the century of uh, long, long ago. And they have uh, 170 years right now, and most of them, they're still in use and they're reused all the time. And I think by, by transforming this idea into nowadays buildings, we can make a, a huge advantage by not tearing down buildings, not needing to reuse something or to have a, a, a building pass. I think it's not necessary. Yeah? And I'm, I'm, I think it's a, it's a huge waste on, on resources uh, if you tear down everything. Do you mean then that after a while, because people want to have new things, etc., it is more a kind of refurbishing? So yep. the, uh, new applications, uh, new objectives, but staying in the same environment, if you want. Yeah. If you have a structure which, which is very strong, yeah, which is very... Uh, uh, um, like Daniel said, yeah, if you have a structure which must, where you have the opportunity that you can change it, yeah, where you can change the usage, where you can build, it's it's always a matter of how the structure of the building is made and how long term you think by designing a building. And I'm I'm not I'm, I I don't think it's necessary to tear the thing down. You can with with very with very little. Um, needles yeah you, you can change the thing totally thanks a lot um, maybe a very short final question before we go to the questions from the audience we you all have shown very tall buildings it was really amazing to see it and uh, it, it gives a kind of feeling of competitiveness of making it taller and and so on but on the other hand, um, I can imagine that in a lot of cases, uh, just buildings for a classical rural or urban environment really make sense as well uh, in this discussion. And how do you look to, to this kind of um, applications or is it not <laughs> challenging enough for an architect? Uh, how do you look at it? <laughs> I think it's more than challenging. And what we did since the, since we, we built our high-rise tower in wood, uh, we did some smaller buildings. At the moment, I'm planning a, um, a subsidized housing project in Vienna, and uh, with with just with wood. And there is a lot of examples which is growing in Vienna from this uh, uh, in this typology. So people are working with this, and wood is already into the towns. It's, it's into the urban structure and um, it's not an, 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 an uh, exotic thing. Yeah, We already deal with this, we work with this. With all the shortcomings you have, if you have a very dense area, you have a very special focus on, on, on fire protection. Um, if you have uh, like um, the, the noise is louder than you have on the rural, uh, in, in, in the countryside. So you have to have more mass on the buildings and, and so on. Yeah. But you can work with this, you can do that. And we all do that. And I think uh, we have the market right now in Austria is, is growing uh, from, let's say, uh, I think, I think uh, 12% uh, in 19, uh, 2010. Uh, over to 18% right now. So uh, there is a growing market of uh, wooden buildings even in the urban cities. Mm -hmm. Maybe also in that way, we can go to more um, use of, of wood chemicals. Uh, if I can turn again to Bruno a little bit. Uh, for instance, there are a lot of efforts ongoing in Europe to make bio-based polyurethane as an, <clears throat> sorry, as an insulation material 
So and in that way, uh, really a lot of possibilities exist because we really have to refurbish a lot of our housings the coming 20, 30 years, of, certainly. Um, maybe, um, I think we have one minute left. If, is there someone who want to add something? Otherwise, I give the floor to Matthias. So thank you, Ludo. I take over again, and uh, I would like to summary a little bit all the given questions out of the chat. We followed up here, and it uh, was quite interesting, and, and, and really quite a lot of things came up. Uh, and there's one, one thing I would like to mention first, um, that is we, all of us are just speaking about the areas where we have a lot of very productive forests. That means in Central Europe or as well in, in Chile, so in other areas. There have been a couple of questions. What are we doing, for example, in Africa? What are we doing in Indonesia? What are we doing in the areas where we don't have this uh, wonderful material like spruce and like pine and all those things, do we have a chance to, to bring up these philosophies, this, this progress in wooden constructions as well? What's your feeling about these things? We have to, to bring up ideas, technologies, know-how to those areas as well, so that they are able to, to work in this area. And that is a big concern out of this chat discussion. Yeah, what are we doing there? Gentlemen, who has an answer? Who has an idea? What, what can we do? Uh, there's construction. Yeah. So if you take clay, what they have is clay. This is the, 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 the traditional building material they use. Uh, and you have to work with this something. There is no, like, uh, this. Not, wood isn't a religion. Yeah. Wood is an opportunity. And if you take another material, which is, uh, which you can find local, you take this material. I, I don't I don't believe in, in, in using a material just to have a material. We have to find what is there. We have to realize that uh, if they have uh, some some resources they can use, uh, we, ha we have to work with this. It makes no sense to bring some trees from from um, Europe to Africa. Okay. Thank you, Oliver. Well, some can more I just add, can I, yes, can I just add a comment on that? I think when we're looking at Africa, we're looking at the whole issue around reforestation is one thing. But secondly, uh, there is that need uh, for housing. And uh, I think that uh, we have to consider local materials, as was just mentioned. But I don't think we should discourage the considerations around things like bamboo, I believe, outside the traditional areas. Uh, that's a locally grown material, uh, tremendous rates of sequestration uh, and storage. Uh, rapid growing, etc., and uh, we now have engineered bamboo uh, products that will allow us to have structural applications. So I'm just suggesting that we've got to think broader than the tradition. Okay, thank you. There was a one one uh, uh, comparison between aluminum against wood. That is one of those gentlemen said, "Yeah, uh, aluminum is easier to recycle against wooden products." But if it takes a life cycle or if it takes a, a, a carbon footprint of, of aluminum against wood, there's, an, a, there's another issue. So we have an always a compromise in between the different evaluation issues, what to use and where to use. I, I believe that will be different. And uh, wood plus concrete, I think that can be the very best combination if we fulfill the right features we need. So I think we don't have an answer for everything. That means it must be done in every different area, we have to evaluate again what will be the best construction, what will be the best hybrid structure. And so I believe, how do you think, how can we give an answer, an, an more or less clever answer to say, what should be the strategy for the future in that? Where to go? More hybrid structure, other materials, other composites. So I think that is something we should address. Just now, please. Andrea, please. Uh, I, I, I do believe that uh, the, the question is, is very complex. As you mentioned, there is no one size fits all. Uh, it all depends on the, on the regions uh, where we are um, living and operating. It depends uh, not only on the availability of bioresources, but also the capacity, the manufacturing capacity 
the supply chains, the value chains, the skills also the, of, the, of the workforce. So there is no one answer, but there is one approach, which is to uh, make the most uh, uh, out of the resources that we have and try to strive to reduce the impact of our designs, of our construction, and therefore mixing materials in a way that is uh, uh, the, the most efficient possible. Uh, is, is the way forward. Uh, if we cannot uh, reduce the embodied carbon of materials because we don't have, the we don't have availability of uh, biomaterials, for example, we might have to strive to reduce the operational emissions by increasing the energy efficiency of our designs. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a game of, uh, of balance, yeah. of equilibrium. Thank you. One other question was, uh, as fears, as danger, if we really promote the wood construction, what does that influence the forest, uh, the deforestation? There is, I mean, if we take out too much material, uh, let's say we should stay sustainable, but in some cases it will maybe other. Do there is a real, a real fear, or do we have to take that into account as a real problem? that uh, we, we damage the, the biodiversity more than allowed or that we go too much deep inside the forest to take out the material? Is that a danger? Or I think, can, be, can that be regulated or is that, is that a governance problem? That's, the people feel that maybe we do too much out of the forest. No, I don't think so. Uh, if we uh, look at it from a solid, robust sustainability approach with sustainable forest management, etc., by definition, and uh, that means that you're not taking uh, too much out. It's in balance. It's an equilibrium of, uh, and the idea is to optimize uh, that ratio or relationship. So, I, I, I quite frankly, I, I, I think we've just got to put greater emphasis when we talk about building with wood, that whole value chain, we have to cast back all the way to the forest and guarantee that through certification protocols and what have you, that we are harvesting sustainably. And uh, obviously the other thing is to grow more trees and the capacity to grow more trees exists on this planet without question. And that's the, the key is how do we incentivize that so that people will do that. Thank you for this answer. It was very important to get this summary again because this was more or less really, really important to get this answer. So, Ludio, I believe that I took together all the most important questions already. So, maybe you can you can take over again for the final conclusions, please. Uh, yeah, indeed. That, okay, I was also very, very, very impressed. That, okay, that. Uh, I would like to ask to maybe Ludo, if you could then conclude this all, so I can then say for 10 final words. So please, Ludo. Uh, thanks a lot. And I, first of all, would like to thank the whole panel for the very nice presentations. It was really amazing. We learned a lot of things. And um, I have certainly also some lessons that we have to take home for the World Bioeconomy Economy Forum for the, next, uh, uh, for the next year, if you want. So I think it's... Uh, it's, it's a story that is not finished here. It is uh, a start and uh, we have to discuss a lot of other things. But we learned uh, that wood can be used as a carbon sink in, in long lasting materials as construction and as replacement of concrete and steel. So it's no doubt if we do that, that is, uh, we have a very high substitution with a very high gain of, um, of, of reduction in carbon emissions. So that's, that's very clear. We can make use of engineered wood by adding chemicals based on wood waste. That was also very nicely shown by Bruno. And um, by um, applying this engineered wood, so this CLT is all glued together, etc., cetera, uh, we really have a lot of opportunities that we didn't have in, in, in the past. And we did not have time to speak about coatings, about... Um, uh, about other uh, bio-based materials like polyurethane, etc. So a lot of things uh, will arise over there as well. So that's a, a second a very high benefit and we could only touch on it uh, today. 
uh, we learned a lot about the great aesthetic opportunities and creating wealthy and healthy living conditions. And we learned the word of biophilia. So it's really very nice to live in a, in a wooden uh, building, in a wooden construction, to touch nature, etc. So that's also certainly a very important point. And linked to that, we have also these effects of these uh, chemicals that we can take from wood where we avoid certain emissions that are done now when we use uh, wood-based panels with a lot of um, uh, phenol uh, formaldehyde emissions, etc., and others, of course. So uh, also we learned from Andrea strongly that um, we can go to new opportunities. We learned about transparent wood. We learned about 3D printing with wood, about uh, wooden constructions where we reduce strongly the amount of wood, etc. So in that way, I think uh, creating high performance with less material is also extremely uh, important point. And we learned very strongly uh, from Daniel and Oliver that these hybrid constructions are very important because by using this mix of materials, we, we um, uh, take out the most efficient way concerning climate, but also concerning quality, concerning safety, etc. So we bring it all uh, together. Um, and we also learned from Ion that it, in, in some cases there is a lot of uh, opportunities still with wood availability, but we still have to discuss. And this brings me to the last point. Um, so I think we have to promise uh, today that we will expand this discussion to engineered bamboo, that's the first point that is very clear, to the afforestation issues, what will be really the benefit of going to afforestation and will that create in 20 years maybe a big market for wooden constructions in the future? And uh, in that way, I um, really would like um, to thank you all and also the audience. And I saw very interesting comments and questions in the audience. <laughs> Uh, um, we promise uh, to make uh, the whole presentations available and also via YouTube, you can repeat um, or re-hear <laughs> the full uh, presentation of today. And we really look forward to meet you again in our next meetings and uh, roundtables. And you have the final word, Yuka. Thanks, Ludo. I don't okay, take too much time because we have three minutes to go and we always keep these at okay, uh, occasions on time. So really, indeed, I would like to also thank all the speakers and okay, moderator Ludo and Matthias. That, okay, it was a great job and uh, I learned a lot, I must confess, but okay, that, okay, we were chatting during this that, okay, uh, round table. Even Matthias learned a lot, so uh, that's, that's something. And he is at okay, of this, this field, so uh, very good insight. So uh, um, I, I tried to, okay, very shortly say that okay that I tempted to say that okay like using this that, okay uh, Olympic motto that uh, Sitius Altius Hortius so faster higher and stronger and we hear that today that there are faster let's say okay methods to setting up and okay the buildings what was that okay told by by Oliver so these kind of hybrid and okay the composite okay and prefabricated, okay, the solution. I think we learn a lot about these, these issues. And on the other hand, that, okay, higher and higher, so altius, that, okay, higher and higher building can be then achieved, that, okay, there is the whole hole in Austria, and then there's the okay, Mjosternet in, in Norway, about the same size, but if asking for Oliver, he said, okay, it's the highest is in Austria, but nevertheless, Nevertheless, that, okay, and it was very interesting to hear also okay, the developments in North America uh, told by Ian that saying that okay, in Canada, in Canada today, you can set up the building with the 12 stores. Can you believe 12 stores? And with the certain circumstances that okay, in um, in US, that, okay, you can set up the buildings up to 18 floors. So that is that is that is really, really something. And also stronger. That okay, the final Olympic motto, if that can be used during these days. So okay, there are stronger uh, okay, structures which are then provided, like this cross laminated timber. It's only a one one example. So uh, these are the okay the issues that okay we learned a lot. We were also touching a bit upon bit this 
climate change issue so that okay what's the role of the wood construction that okay now i think that okay it will deserve another round table as was said by by ludo and we are certainly coming back to that that topic so that okay the uh, uh, what the multiple role the forest do have they are certainly they are the, let's say it okay uh, acting as a carbon sinks and carbon stocks but we have to bear in mind that also this all the kind of food construction materials they are also storing to okay, the carbon so uh, we will revisit that topic especially in our main forum which will take place in in september and we will announce that okay the next forum uh, when and where and with the type of teams will be then included. We will announce that, okay, uh, in the end of this, this month. So uh, looking forward to seeing you also within the, okay, some upcoming events. Actually, the next roundtable is already decided. Uh, it will be held on 7th of April. And on that uh, roundtable, we will then concentrated on the bioeconomy people, planet policies, and self-evidently uh, it will be moderated by Christian Paterma. I, I think the great Christian is listening to us today. So thanks again. Thanks for the speakers. Thanks for the moderator. Thanks for the Matthias. And uh, special thanks to Tammy to, to run us through this uh, roundtable today. So with these words, okay, uh, see you next time and uh, have a good evening.